Good evening, everyone. I hope, hope you can hear me okay. The mic is on. I'm reassured it's on. Good stuff. This is a bit precarious looking at this uh, stand here. So if it falls over, you know, just bear with me. Um, so good to see everyone tonight. Thanks for coming out. Um, tonight we're going to be looking at John chapter 16, as you can see from the PowerPoint. Um, and in particular, the verses we're going to be looking at tonight are actually from uh, verse 16 to 33. However, I wanted to start off by um, just going through some of the part of the first chapter up to verse 15, which gives you the context of what um, Jesus is saying to his disciples. Um, and it helps you to understand then from verse 16 on to 33 what Jesus is then explaining to his disciples further. So John chapter 16 is a, a very significant chapter in the New Testament. If you've uh, not read it before, it's, it's a great chapter for a number of reasons. But um, if you're familiar with John's gospel, you'll know that in John chapter 17, Jesus prays uh, before he is, before he is uh, betrayed in chapter 18 uh, and arrested. And then in chapter 19, we know that he is tried by Pilate and, and then crucified. So these are hugely dramatic chapters in, in John's gospel. But John chapter 16 maybe gets overlooked sometimes uh, in favor of, you know, 17, 18, and 19, where they're certainly full of drama as Jesus is crucified and, and tried. And in John chapter 16, Jesus is actually spending his last hours with his followers, his disciples. This is his last opportunity to to talk to them and to explain to them what is going to happen in the next few days. And it's remarkable as you read the chapter, um, the detail which Jesus goes into and, and the, the, the certainty that he has about the things that are about to happen. Um, I'm just going to move this a bit because I'm in case I trip over it. Um, it's really a remarkable chapter. When you read it in the context of what happens after it, the things that Jesus is saying to them, a lot of it all makes sense. Um, and I'm just going to take you through some of the, some of the things that Jesus says to the disciples before uh, we get into the main text. So in verse 2, he says to them, <clears throat> and I'll just read this. Uh, if I read the first, first verse 2 just for context. I have told you all this so that you won't lose your faith when you face troubles. People will tell you to leave their synagogues and never come back. In fact, the time will come when they think that killing you would be doing a service for God. So Jesus is warning his disciples that, you know, after, uh, they obviously don't understand at this point when Jesus is talking to them that what is about to happen, that Jesus is about to be crucified, but Jesus is telling them, you know, there'll come a time when you'll be killed for your faith. And then in verse 4 he says to them, <clears throat> I have told you all this now to prepare you, so when the time comes for these things to happen, you'll remember that I warned you. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus is telling them again he says that you know I'm not going to be here he's trying to prepare his disciples he's trying to you know let them know that he's not going to be around and this is his way of explaining to them he says remember these things remember that I warned you remember um, in verse 5 he goes on to say to them <clears throat> now I'm going back to the one who sent me and I'm not, none of you ask me where are you going so he's telling them again, he says, I'm going back to the one who sent me. Who sent him? Now, God sent Jesus, didn't he? We know that. Um, and he's explained to the disciples that he's going to go back to God. He's going to go back to the Father. And then in verse 7, he says another remarkable thing to them. He says, uh, and I'll read the verse. <clears throat> Let me assure you it is better for you that I go away. I say this because when I go away, I will send the helper to you. But if I did not go, the helper would not come. So Jesus is now talking to them about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who will come to replace him. And he's explaining to them, he has in the previous chapters of John, and all the way through John, he talks, starts to talk about the Holy Spirit in the earlier chapters of John to them, and he talks about the Holy Spirit that will come. But he has to go for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit isn't going to come while he's there. And he's explaining to them that when he goes, it will be better for them because the Holy Spirit will come and comfort them and be a help to them. So he's describing a whole new relationship that they're not aware of at this point, and how could they, how could they understand or how could they know? Because they, 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 do, they don't understand a lot of what Jesus is saying about the fact that he's now prophesying his, his death and his resurrection. 
So Jesus is describing a new order to them, a new way of things. You know, they have the privilege on earth of being with Jesus during this time in his earthly ministry where they can see him face to face and they can talk to him every day. And they're sitting at his feet every day listening to, his, to him explaining what it's like to be part of the kingdom of God. And they have this amazing privilege of being up close and personal with Jesus every day. And they are, really are a privileged uh, bunch in that sense, these disciples, aren't they? Because how many people have had that opportunity? So Jesus is describing them a walk of faith and a departed Savior. Once he goes, he is describing to them what this walk of faith is going to look like for them. He's telling them that they might be killed for their faith, and many of them were. But he's explaining to them that this walk of faith is going to, that he's not going to be around. They're going to be on their own. In John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus says to Thomas, who is known as Doubting Thomas, after Jesus has risen from the dead, Thomas says, unless I see the, the prints of the nails in his hands and put my hand in, in those prints, I will not believe. And in John chapter 20, when Jesus has risen again, he says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, but yet have believed. And tonight we are those blessed people. We as Christians are the blessed ones that Jesus refers to here. We have not seen Jesus with our own eyes, but we believe we have faith. We are those who walk by faith every day. We walk by faith today, not by sight. The disciples walked by sight. They saw Jesus every day. They listened to his ministry. They heard his teachings. They were familiar with the Old Testament. They came to understand that he was, in fact, the Messiah. The Messiah was walking before them every day. We do not have that privilege but we are, those, we are those blessed ones who walk by faith. In John alone, there are seven references to those believers. The believers, we are in amongst that group of people. We are the believers, those who have faith, those who have never seen but yet have believed. We are in that category, category tonight, and Jesus is talking about us. And so moving on, Jesus has talked to them about what might happen. He's talked about the comfortable, comfortable who will come to help. And then from verses 8 to 11, we learn a bit more about what this helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, will do, what his role will be in the world. In verse 8, we read that he will convict the world of sin. His job is to convict the world of sin. We also read that he will reveal God's righteousness to those who believe. And we also read that he will demonstrate Christ's judgment over Satan, the prince of darkness. Now in verse 12, I think it is, um, or verse 11, sorry, Jesus says, and he will show them how wrong their judgment is because their leader has already been condemned. Jesus is referring to the devil here, Satan. He's saying their leader, the leader of this world, the prince of this world, the prince of darkness, has already been condemned. And the Holy Spirit will come to this earth and he will fulfill these roles after Jesus has departed. <clears throat> and so we see that as Jesus explains the role of the Holy Spirit, he then takes, takes it a step further and then explains that in the general sense what the Holy Spirit is influence on the world and how he will influence the world. But then he goes on to say to them how he will guide them. In verse 13 he talks about guiding them in all truth which is yet to come. Verse 13. He's helping the disciples. The Holy Spirit will guide them in truth. He will prepare them for the future battle. He, is revealing, he will reveal to them the nature of their mission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to make disciples of all men. That will be their role. And then in verse 14, it talks about the helper. It will pass on the message. So the things that the Father tells, to the, the Father will tell the Spirit, the Spirit will pass on to the disciples. And this is what the disciples record for us in the gospel, isn't it? This is the divine inspired word of God that we have in our hands tonight. 
And how did it get here? It got here through the Holy Spirit interceding with these disciples, didn't it? As, as the Holy Spirit revealed God's truth to them, and as they remembered the things that Jesus had taught them while he was with them, they then wrote it down in these Gospels. And that is incredible. Jesus is actually predicting here in these verses how the Gospels would be written. It would be the Holy Spirit that would reveal him to them and inspire them to write the Gospels that we have in our hands tonight. And here Jesus is explaining to us in these verses how this would happen before it had even happened, before he was even, had even been crucified. So how does the Holy Spirit achieve these things? How does the Holy Spirit influence the world in the way that we've been taught about how he will convict people of sin, he will show God's righteousness? Well, he does it through those controlled by the Spirit. We are, as Christians, are controlled by the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit lives in us as Christians, as believers. The Bible tells us that. When we become believers, the Holy Spirit will come and dwell on us. And these three tasks of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can only carry out in this world through His, through the followers of Jesus. Not by Himself, not the Holy Spirit on His own. He cannot influence the world in that way, but only through the people who are followers of Jesus. And this is our responsibility. These tasks of the Holy Spirit that we've talked about are our responsibility. And we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to carry out these, these roles. It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit is going to do it on his own. Firstly, he influences and changes and establishes Christianity through the disciples. But then, that as, as time has moved on, that responsibility has been passed on to us. So when we feel the Holy Spirit's influence in our life, when we feel the Holy Spirit telling us to do something, or we feel led to do something, and we feel a strong compulsion to do something, we wonder where that comes from. That comes from the Holy Spirit who is within us. And we have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives, because when we don't, then we are preventing these things happening in the world. And so the Holy Spirit has a, a major role to play Here we go. And we're going to move into a reading tonight, which is verse 16 to 33. Well, is just going to bring it up for us now. Now, I've picked a, a new version tonight. You might have heard of it. It's called the ERV version. Who knows? Who's heard of the ERV version? It's the easy reading version, Aaron. So if you were looking for your Bible before you came out tonight, I've got it. <laughs> I'll give it back to I'll give you it back at the end, son. It's the easy reading version, easy reading version, and it is very easy to read. <laughs> Easier for me to say. And here's what it says in verse 16. After a short time you won't see me, then after another short time you will see me again. Some of the followers said to each other, What does he mean when he says, After a short time you won't see me? Then after another short time, you will see me again. And what does he mean when he says, because I am going to the Father? They also ask, what does he mean by a short time? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that the followers wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking each other what I meant when I said, after a short time, you won't see me? Then after another short time, you will see me again. The truth is, you will cry and be sad, but the world will be happy. You will be sad, but then your sadness will change to happiness. When a woman gives birth to a baby, she has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the pain. She forgets because she is so happy that a child has been born into the world. It is the same with you. Now you are sad, but I will see you again, and you will be happy. You will have a joy that no one else can take away. In that day, you will not have to ask me about anything. And I assure you, my Father will give you anything you ask for in my name. You have never asked for anything in this way before, but ask in my name and you will receive, and you will have the fullest joy possible. I have told you these things using words that hide the meaning, but the time will come 
and I will not use words like that to tell you things. I will speak to you in plain words about the Father. Then you will be able to ask the Father for things in my name. I am not saying that I will have to ask the Father for you. The Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and he loves you because you have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father into the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then his followers said, you are already speaking plainly to us. You are not using words that hide the meaning. We can see now that you know all things. You answer our questions even before we ask them. This makes us believe that you came from God. Jesus said, so now you believe. Listen to me, a time is coming when you will be scattered, each to his own home. In fact, that time is already here. You will leave me and I will be alone. But I am never really alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that you can have peace in me. In the world you will have troubles, but be brave. I have defeated the world. Thanks, Ross. So here Jesus is, is uh, again explaining to the disciples. Verse 16 in the, the phrase is in a little while, probably in your translation, not in the one that I read, but in a little while he says, and Jesus uses time, doesn't he? He is the master of time. He likes to frame events by time. The one who controls time itself is now explaining the timings of his departure from this earth. He will go and come back again, his death and resurrection. As he says in verse 16, I will go for a little while and then I will return. He's talking about the three days that he will lie in the tomb for and then be resurrected. And then in verse 29 he talks about a time is coming when they will see him and they will be happy again. And then at the start of chapter 17, verse 1, he says, the time has come. So he mentions time here through this, throughout this chapter as he explains the timings of his departure from this earth. So these chapter, this chapter 16 is really how, how Jesus frames these events in time. It's really the beginning of the end now for Jesus, isn't it? He's describing the end of his earthly journey and his return to the Father and he's preparing the disciples for these times. And shortly after this, in chapter 17, he prays to the Father. He prays for his disciples, and he prays for his followers in the future, doesn't he? And then after that, in chapter 18, he's betrayed and arrested. In chapter 19, he is tried and, and crucified. But firstly, the disciples don't get it, do they? When he says to them in verse 16, in a little while, you will see me. In a little while I will go to the Father and then I will return. In a little while, he says. They don't understand. And they say in verse 17, what does he mean? The disciples are confused because they don't understand. What does he mean by a little while? Well, we know that from what he says here. By in a little while I will go and then I will return. He's talking. He's referring to the three days that he will be dead and then he will return to them. In a little while. And how could they understand what was about to happen? How could they understand that he was about to be betrayed by one of his own and then tried as a political pawn by Pilate? How, how could they know these events would happen so in, such a, in such, just a few days from then? And so we move on to the parable, that he, the parable of his purpose. In verse 19 to 24, he talks about you know, we talk about uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And here Jesus again illustrates what it would be like for them when he departs. He talks about a woman in childbirth and how painful and, I, and how difficult that can be. And yet after the child is born, there is joy. And the woman forgets the pain that she's suffered. You know, that's a bit like what we are just now, aren't we, as Christians in this world? We are in this period of pain and anxiety and stress as we look around us in the world and we look for the name of Jesus to be upheld and to be honoured as we like to do and we just don't see that do we? We see so much turmoil we see so much 
uh, so many wars, so much fighting and suffering, especially amongst Christians who are persecuted. And we are like this period of labor for a woman in childbirth just now. And one day, we will see joy, won't we, when we get to heaven. All of that suffering will be behind us. And in that day, we will understand, just like the disciples will, as he says to them here. In verse 21, he says, sorry, in verse 22, he says, this is their time of grief and suffering. This is our time of grief and suffering as Christians too. In verse 23, he says to them, in that day you will not have to ask. And Jesus is jumping forward to the future here, isn't he, to his disciples, and he's saying, you know, when you, in that day you won't have to ask because it will all make sense to you then. And it's a bit like that for us, the hope of being home and being in heaven with our Savior. We too, in that day, won't have to ask. It will all make perfect sense. All the sufferings, all the things that we endure here on this earth that don't make sense to us now, that confuse us, that we ask, why, Lord, why does this happen? Why do people suffer? Why do people, good people die? Why do good people suffer? Why is there so much injustice in the earth? We ask these questions as Christians, don't we? Because they, they cause us to, to wonder and they cause us to, to question at times. But in that day, like the disciples, we will not have to ask. But then he says to them in verse 24, But now ask in my name, and you will receive whatever you require. And again, the disciples are confused, because the Holy Spirit has not yet come. But Jesus is again telling them how, that when they are on their own, as they will be shortly, that they will have to ask for help. They will need help then. In verse 26, Jesus is teaching them to pray and ask the Father for, for things in his name. Because up to now, the disciples have had this daily interaction with Jesus. He's been among them every day. They've been able to ask him, teacher, ask him questions about why things are the way they are. Watch him perform miracles. Watch him heal the sick, even raise the dead. Watch him feed the 5,000. They have witnessed all these things firsthand. And now he's saying to them, I'm not going to be here much longer. So I have to teach you how to pray. And I have to teach you how to pray through the Holy Spirit who will come. And through the Holy Spirit you'll ask the Father for things in his name. In verse 27 Jesus explains the Father's love for them. He says that though because you have believed in me, the Father loves you in the same way that the Father loves me. And then in verse 28, again, he goes back to what he said in verse 16. He has came from the Father, and now he will return to the Father. So again, he is predicting the end to his disciples. And finally, Verse 29 is a great verse. Verse 29 is when the penny finally drops for the disciples. You can almost see the, the lights go on in their minds. And this is what he says. Then his followers said, You're already speaking plainly to us. You're not using words that hide the meaning. We can see now that you know all things. You answer our questions even before we ask them. This makes us believe that you came from God. So finally, the disciples realize that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is from God. And they are now convinced that Jesus is God's son. Even after all this time that they've spent with him, even after all these miracles, they still have doubts. They still truly maybe don't understand who he really is. But this is a huge acknowledgement from them. You know, Jesus says to them that he will no longer talk to them in parables, but he will talk to them plainly. And in verse 29, the response is very 
overwhelming, isn't it, when they say that we now believe. You don't have to speak to us in parables anymore. We understand. We understand who you are. And now Jesus responds with instructions to them because he knows what lies ahead for them. In verse 31, he says, So now you believe, listen to me, a time is coming when you will be scattered, each to his own home. In fact, that time is already here. You will leave me and I will be alone. But I am never really alone because the Father is with me. So Jesus is again explaining to them that they will be scattered. In verse 2, he talked about how they would be killed for their faith. They would be thrown out of the synagogues. And people would think that they are doing a service to God by killing them. And now he's telling them they'll be scattered. Well, why will they be scattered? Because the shepherd is gone, isn't he? The shepherd is gone. The shepherd is about to depart, and they are like sheep. They are now vulnerable. In our study last couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the shepherd and the sheep and how the sheep know the shepherd's voice and respond to the shepherd's voice and are protected by the shepherd. The shepherd looks out for them, he looks out for the security and their welfare, protects them from the wild animals who would devour them. And here he is saying to them, they're, they're about to be scattered like sheep without a shepherd. They're about to be persecuted for being followers of him. He's preparing them for what is about to happen. In verse 32, he talks about what it's like to be alone, doesn't he? He tells them they will be alone, they will be scattered. And he says that I will be alone. And I think in verse 32, he's referring to his, as he faces the cross alone. Surely, he knows what is about to happen. He understands his fate. He knows his mission on earth is to be put to death on a cross for our sins. And here he says, I am about to be alone too. You will be alone, but I will be alone. He's about to face the cross alone. Friendless, he climbs towards the hill, doesn't he? With his cross, carrying his own cross. And here he is empathizing with his disciples because he says, I'm about to be alone too. Jesus faced the cross alone. He didn't face it with his army of disciples by his side, fighting his battle for him. He didn't have a, a council with him when Pilate tried him and falsely accused him. No, he was on his own. He was on his own. He faced that on his own. Not with his own team of lawyers to protect him or to, to, to speak for him. No, he had to speak for himself. He faced the trial on his own. Very often in life we face trials on our own too, don't we? Sometimes we think, we ask God, why? Why, I, why have I to face this trial on my own? Why can nobody else fight this battle for me? Why me? And we feel lonely at times, don't we? But this is where the Holy Spirit comes and draws near to us, as Jesus has said here. I am never really alone because the Father is with me, he says. Friends might desert us as the disciples were forced to do. They were forced to flee when Jesus was arrested because they were followers of Jesus and they were fearful for their own lives. They too would have been tried, and many of them were. They were hunted down and executed, a lot of them, for following Jesus. They paid a heavy price. Their faith was truly tested. Their devotion to their Lord truly tested. In verse 32, sorry, verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you can have peace in me. In this world you will have troubles, but be brave, I have defeated the world. The promise of peace, Jesus is about to leave them, but he promises them peace. He promises them peace. The Bible talks about peace. Only God can give true peace in this world. People search for peace. People search for happiness. 
But only God can truly give us peace in this world, in a troubled world. Some of the verses that talk about peace. Psalm 29, verse 11. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Isaiah 48, 18. Your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea. And finally, John 14, 27. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus is the legacy. Jesus' legacy is peace, rather. That is his legacy in this world. That's what he left us. My peace I leave with you, he says. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Another one there from Philippians talks about peace that passes all understanding. And so we come to the end. And as you will hear next week, when Paul talks about chapter 17 in more detail, the time has come. Jesus' time has come, finally. We'll read it together. Chapter 17, verse 1. He says, After Jesus said these things, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Give glory to your Son so that the Son can give glory to you. The time that he's referring to is the time of his crucifixion. As he's been talking to his disciples here, explaining to them that he will go and he will come back again. And he will go back to the Father. Here he says, the time has come. He knows what's about to happen. He knows he's about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that Judas will betray him and the guards will come and arrest him. He knows what is just around the corner for him. And he says, now the time has come. In verse 6, he prays for his disciples, doesn't he? He says, You gave me some people from the world. I have shown them what you are like. He's talking about his disciples. They belong to you, and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your teaching. And then lastly, in verse 20, he prays for us, the future believers. I pray not only for these followers, but also for those who will believe in me because of their teaching. And here we see the amazing start of the Christian movement, don't we? As Jesus explains to his disciples what was about to happen to him, he prays for them, and then he prays for the people who will follow them, and that is us. And we stand here tonight as a product of that prayer that Jesus prayed in chapter 17. Jesus prays for us at this point. And so tonight as we think about these things may they be an encouragement to us in our daily walk with God just as Jesus talked to his disciples here just as he encouraged them here to tell them that the Holy Spirit would come, that a comforter would come and help them we too have that comforter with us today and we too must walk every day with him in our lives but the challenge to us tonight is the influence that the Holy Spirit has in this world is through us as Christians. It's not through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't do it on his own. The Holy Spirit does it through Christ's followers. And that is us here tonight sitting here in Westwood Hill. And so I leave these thoughts with you and trust it will be an encouragement to you as we enter another week together. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who came to this earth, who sojourned amongst us here, who performed his earthly ministry, but who ultimately went to the cross and died on a cross to take our place, to take the punishment that was due us on his body. Father, we thank you that he is risen. He is with you again in heaven. Father, we thank you that he has left his Holy Spirit with us as your people on earth to do your work and to be the salt and light in this world that you have asked us to be. 
And so, Father, we pray that you will help us to do that this week. And over the coming weeks, as we reach out here to the community around us, through the holiday clubs and the various activities that will go on in the summer, help us to be your people here in East Kilbride for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.